Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History webinar series. I'm Marin, and I'll be your host for this webinar. We'd love to know where you're listening from and how you heard about today's webinar. You can enter that into the polls on the left side of the screen. Uh, for our next webinar, we'll be hearing from James Tanner on Thursday, September 20th at 4 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. He'll be giving a presentation entitled, Using Multiple Online Genealogy Programs to Find Your Ancestors. If you have any questions or comments, you're welcome to email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu. Um, Today we are listening to a presentation from Catherine Grant, um, which is entitled uh, From Snarky to Civil, Improving the Way We Treat Each Other in the Genealogy Community. Catherine is a teacher, writer, and family history enthusiast. She enjoys helping others build their family trees and believes that anyone can learn to love family history and to do it. Catherine teaches Sunday classes at the BYU Family History Library and presents at other family history events. Her column on family history ran in the Nauvoo Times for about a year and is still available. Catherine works for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as a technical writer with a focus on usability and process improvement. Besides family history, she loves uplifting music, thought-provoking books, and fresh raspberries. Um, so as we get uh, Catherine all set up, I'll just bring your attention over to the questions box um, in the top left corner. Any questions that you have can go there, um, and at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll answer those. You're welcome to provide any insights or comments along uh, the webinar, um, and that's uh, the bottom left box. Um, so as uh, the presentation goes on, um, feel free to uh, type your comments in there, especially if you have um, audio problems or um, visual problems, I can address those. Um, and I think we're ready. Great, Marin, thank you so much. And everybody, thank you for joining us today. I'm so grateful to have you all with us. This webinar, I think, might be one of the most important ones that we've ever offered at BYU, uh, just because of the subject matter. I think it's something that's really needed in the genealogical community, and I hope that this will help all of us. I know that I'm certainly not perfect at it, and preparing this webinar has actually caused me to reflect a lot on how I could improve, and I've seen uh, ways that maybe all of us could do a little bit better in treating each other with greater civility in our genealogical community. So let's go ahead and look at what we're going to be covering today. First of all, we'll talk a little bit about what we might call the civility problem, what it is and why it's a problem. And I do want to mention up front, as far as that goes, there are many, many examples of people doing wonderful things in the community and getting along very well. So I don't want to minimize all the good and wonderful things that are happening, but I definitely see signs of a problem. And I've um, noticed in our online forums that other people have mentioned that they see a problem as well. So acknowledging that there's a lot of good, we also want to maybe address the problem a little bit and make things even better. And so that moves us to the second part of the webinar, which will be thoughts on improving civility. So the civility problem, what exactly are we talking about when we say that? I thought the best way to show that would be for um, me to share some real life examples. And I didn't want to get into, you know, my mother's sisters, brothers, uncles, cousin, aunt had something happen to them. So each of these examples are either ones that I've experienced personally or that a friend has personally experienced. So there's only one degree of separation between me and the example. So I wanted to, to make that clear up front that they are real examples from real life, not just rumors. 
so what some of you might remember this actually happened in a webinar that I gave a couple years ago somebody had asked a question and wanted us to go out to family search and we did or actually excuse me we went out to the get satisfaction community site and this was the comment that came up at the top I I didn't go to the site knowing or expecting it was just it showed up when we went to the site so some angry user had put in their comment your site sucks and they were saying this to family search in general apparently they didn't like some changes or something like that but it was just interesting to me that okay here we've got a free site that doesn't cost anybody anything except it actually has cost family search quite a, a, a bit of time and effort and, and money to develop this site that they hope will help us with our genealogy and so to rail on family search for a free product that they've tried so hard to make good was just a very interesting um, interesting response you are hateful this was said to a friend of mine when he commented to another user in family searches family tree that she had um, incorrectly connected some people and he wasn't trying to be rude or, or abrasive or anything he wanted to solve the problem and he said later okay you know maybe I could have been a little you know more gentle or tactful or whatever but he didn't try to be offensive or rude and so apparently she didn't like being told that she had made a mistake and, and I guess that's hard right probably most people don't enjoy that but I I felt like that response was a little strong to come back and say you are hateful because you pointed out some error that I had made this one was sad to me this was related to be to me by one of my close friends who's a member of a group that I will not identify because the point here is not to cast blame but in this group the members of this group would mock people that they perceived to be quote and unquote experts by calling them genies that was it was not intended to be a complimentary term it was intended to kind of put them down and make fun of them because they supposedly I guess thought they were better than everybody else because they were experts or whatever but it was definitely used as a disparaging term here's something else that a friend of mine was told you are a hypocrite and a roadblock and this was to my surprise said by an expert to a friend of mine who was just an ordinary guy and actually one of the nicest guys you could meet he was a consultant a temple and family history consultant and he was trying to teach the people in his ward to do careful research and not to just you know rush off with half verified names to the temple and this other person saw what he was doing and um, you know, became aware of it and so accused him of being a hypocrite and a roadblock which was actually a very different response than the students in his class at church gave they they loved what he was doing so that was really interesting that this uh, quote unquote expert felt the need to um, criticize a, a just a regular consultant that he didn't he didn't agree with that person's teaching methods and then finally this was one that I experienced I was in a discussion online on get satisfaction we were talking about the challenges of using green temple hunting approaches and and why that might not always be the best approach and a person that I didn't know and had never met and actually still haven't met uh, responded to one of my posts by saying well you just don't want beginners to succeed and I wondered at that afterwards I didn't know the person well enough to be offended I guess you know they say that the people who can hurt us are the people that we we know and love and I didn't even know this person at all and so it was just an interesting um, response to my post that this person concluded without ever having talked with me or seen me or having met me that I was the type of person that that didn't want beginners to succeed so all of these responses have something in common I actually don't remember what movie this is from I think it's probably a John Wayne movie we could probably Google it but it just reminds me of that quote them's fighting words so we've got these kind of accusatory words you suck you're a roadblock you're hateful you're a genie you're a hypocrite those are not the kinds of words those aren't civil words those aren't words that are calculated to 
promote good relationships or build rapport? What do they have in common? Every one of them attacks the person, not the problem. So why? Why do we do this? We and all of us, I'm guessing, have probably reacted this way at some time. I know I have. I'm trying to be more careful, but yeah, there have been times when I've flown off the handle and dashed off kind of a curt or hurtful response on an online forum. So why do we do this? We're, we're generally nice people. We, we know how to be civil. So why do we act in a way that hurts others and hurts ourselves and really burns bridges? It, it's a crazy thing that, you know, normally nice people can just sometimes fly off the handle. Well, as I've thought about my own reactions and as I've talked with other people and, and observed people's behavior, I think there are a number of reasons and they're generally not malicious. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, I, or at least no sane person, right, gets up in the morning and says, I'd really like to make someone's life miserable today. We just typically don't do that out of the blue. So one of the reasons that we kind of get our hackles up a little bit is that we really are passionate about our family history. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's only a bad thing when we use it as a reason to be blind to others people's, other people's needs and feelings. Another reason that I really think does have an effect is that we live in a culture of put down sarcasm and anger. All you have to do is watch a political broadcast for like 20 seconds or even watch a, a sitcom. And the vast majority of the humor that we hear is at other people's expense. It's putting people down. We see examples of, of people being angry with other people. We talk about road rage, all these things. Our culture really has become a culture where, as the scripture said, the love of people is waxing cold and it's being replaced with this sarcasm and this anger. Another big thing is that we sometimes feel anonymous online. Like we we know we're probably never going to meet the person and somehow it it frees us and not in a good way to say things that we would never say to a person's face. Now, I had an example of this actually um, dealing with uh, my car, but it's the same kind of thing. In a car, we feel like we're kind of insulated from from people, from their faces, from their feelings. So one day I was at a stoplight getting ready to turn into work and somebody was in front of me and they did something that, that ticked me off. I, I actually don't even remember what it was at this point, but they either cut in front of me or something to get over in the lane to turn and I was ticked. So I honked at him and uh, then I, I just kind of, you know, put me in a bad mood and I went in and turned into the parking lot and noticed that the car that I had just honked at and been rude to was turning into the same parking lot. And the driver got out and it was my coworker. Was I ever embarrassed? And he was, I think, a bit surprised, probably didn't think that this rude person honking at him was would turn out to be his coworker. And so I, uh, you know, tried to cover myself. I was embarrassed and I just, I learned such a good lesson from that, that it just wasn't worth it for me to act in a moment of anger because I felt anonymous, but it wasn't really anonymous. This was my coworker. And it's the same thing online. We, these people, if we knew them, we would probably really like them and we'd probably really get along well. So why let anonymity cause us not to be civil? Okay, now this is another very real issue in the latter days. Well, it's been all since the beginning of the earth. But one of Satan's great strategies is really to stir up us to stir us up to anger against each other because he knows if he can do that, he can stop the progress of the church, he can stop our personal progress, he can cause damage to Heavenly Father's plan. So when we yield ourselves to be angry, we're we're kind of falling right into a trap. And so we, that's a, a very real problem, but fortunately that's something that we can actually avoid and we'll be talking about that a little bit later. I guess we could sum up all these things by saying that when we're uncivil to people, 
it's generally because we've lost sight of the other person's humanity. They've ceased to be a person to us. They've either become some kind of object or tool or obstacle, but we see them in the light of our own needs and our own preferences. And we forget that they have needs and preferences and feelings as well. And I think if there was one thing we could do to improve our civility to each other, it would be to to try as best we can to see the reality of other people. I wanted to make a comment about gossip here. Mostly we've been talking about interactions between people that aren't going that well. But we also can be uncivil behind people's backs. I'll give you an example that actually didn't have anything to do with family history, but I was talking to a friend of mine one day and she made a derogatory comment about a common friend of ours. And I kind of didn't know what to say because I, I was stunned. I didn't realize that she kind of didn't like this person. And I just thought, wow, this. And so later when I saw the person, what do you think came back into my mind? Well, the rude comment of my friend. Oh my goodness, that was my battery. Sorry, you guys, let me plug in. OK, there we go. So my friend might not have thought that her words would have any effect beyond speaking to me, but they did have an effect on me afterwards. I found myself kind of not necessarily doubting our third friend, but I promise uh, like several times when I saw our mutual friend, her words came back to me and that was just very uncomfortable. And one thing I've noticed in my life too is that when we get angry at people and we gossip about people, we're almost never telling a true story. Anger almost always distorts the truth. So we have to ask ourselves, when we're pre presenting this self-justifying story to somebody, are we bearing false witness about the other person? And I hope that we can ask ourselves that if we're ever tempted to gossip or to say something unkind behind somebody's back. And you know what? It doesn't matter if we think it's true or not. What good can come of gossiping behind somebody's back? When I was a primary president in California, I implemented a rule with my presidency because you know sometimes in presidencies you're talking about people that you might want to call or um, people that you for some reason aren't going to consider or uh, issues excuse me, that there might be with people, you know, with leaders in the primary or children or whatever. So there are legitimate reasons to talk about people, but I, we made it a rule in our presidency that we would talk about people as if they were present. And that really changed the way we talked about people. It helped us to stay civil. It helped us to stay sensitive to them and to not say things that, that we might later regret or that might not be completely accurate or at least that they might not agree were accurate. So I think that's probably a good thing in any circumstances. Before we start talking to somebody about another person, if, you just, if, you, if there is a need to talk about the other person, talk as if they were there and could hear everything that you were saying. Okay, so what are some thoughts about improving civility? We started out with some negative examples of times that people had been uncivil. So I thought that maybe what we could do here is talk about a couple of times when people have been civil. So I have two examples I wanted to share. One took place at the Riverton Saturday Seminar, and it's probably been about three or four years now. And I regret that I don't remember this person's name because I would have loved to acknowledge their kindness because they really had an impact on me. So this person had given a keynote at the seminar, and afterwards people came up to talk to him. And a woman was ahead of me, so we had, you know, a line of people. And she just lit into him. She criticized family search. She didn't criticize his presentation, but she took it as an opportunity to kind of unburden herself of what she felt was wrong with family search and family tree. 
and this good brother, it, it almost makes me emotional to think back on this scene that I witnessed. He stood there with this gracious smile on his face, and it didn't seem forced. It seemed genuine. He smiled at her. He responded sympathetically, graciously. There was nothing in his tone or in his words that indicated the slightest impatience or irritation. It was truly a model of a Christ-like response, and I thought, how is he doing that? I was just so deeply touched by the way he showed pure love to this person who, for whatever reason, maybe she was having a bad day, whatever it was, was railing on him, and he didn't return that railing. He returned the railing with love. And I, I would love to follow his example in all the interactions of my life. Another example that I've actually shared in, in earlier webinars is a friend of mine who was working in Family Tree and he found that somebody had messed up his tree. How dare they? And he was ticked. He got ready to dash off an angry message to this person who had done something that was obviously incorrect and easy to prove. If the person had looked at sources, they would have known. But fortunately, my friend said he paused and thought to himself, OK, I've got to cool down here just a little bit before I write this, this uh, message to this person. And he did. When he wrote the message, it was just short and courteous. And he basically just said, hey, I noticed you were working on so-and-so in Family Tree. And I wonder if you were aware that uh, this uh, thing that you just changed is actually not right. Well. Not too long afterwards, he got an uh, answer. There were two things that were significant about this answer. One was that the girl was a teenager. She was uh, trying to follow her leader's counsel to get involved in family history. She had no experience whatsoever, and she was doing her best to follow what her leaders had told her. So there's one thing. What do you think if this teenage girl had gotten an angry response from another user of Family Tree? Would she want to keep doing family history? I'm kind of guessing no. I'm kind of guessing, too, at that age, feelings are very tender, and she might have been very hurt. And maybe it would have been years before she'd done family history. Maybe it would have even damaged her testimony. And so that was one thing that my friend was so grateful that, you know, he had no idea it was a teenage girl from the username. There was no way to tell. But he was so glad that he had been uh, more gracious and more civil in his uh, message to her. The other thing was she turned out to be the daughter of a relative that he knew. So it was his relative by extension. But as I recall, he had not met her, but he knew the mother. And so if you can imagine this relative going back to her mother, maybe in tears, saying, Mom, I just got the most hateful message, the most mean message from somebody in Family Tree. They're all mad at me for something. I don't even know what I was doing. And, and then the mom would probably recognize the name of, of my friend. And who knows what family rift that could have caused. So thank goodness that my friend took a moment to just be calm and think about how to to act in a civil way and it paid off big time because not only did he avoid the problems he actually became a mentor to this family member so those are two examples that i just love and that have inspired me as far as being civil in our interactions with each other so i we should ask ourselves whenever we're faced with the temptation to be rude or mean or, or uncivil, whatever we want to call it, ask ourselves, are we seeing the situation truly? And there are four keys here that you see on the screen to doing that. The first one really is to be humble, to admit that we don't know it all and we might be wrong and the other person might be right, just to kind of try to avoid any sense of arrogance or self-righteousness or judgmentalism. Just kind of stay in that humble place, even as the scriptures say the depths of humility. That's a beautiful place to be. The second point here is examine your assumptions about the person and the problem. I know that when the user on Get Satisfaction made the assumption that I wanted beginners to fail, 
that didn't seem real to me. I, I hope that that's not correct about me. So I hope that was a false assumption. And I think on occasion we all do make these false assumptions. So let's question our negative assumptions about the other person and about the problem. And moving on to the third bullet, let's assume that their intent is good. Even if they're getting a little feisty or angry or whatever, let's assume that they it's because they care about family history or because they, they believe that they're accurate and that a mistake has been made. And then finally, to emphasize the point that we've made earlier, let that person be real to you. It kind of goes back to the golden rule where the Savior said, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. That was a way of asking us to see other people's humanity. So when we see their humanity, it's easier to be civil and, and it's really harder to hurt them and to be rude. So when we have disagreements, a lot of times uh, we don't want to accept that other per another person might have a valid opinion that's different than ours. And I just kind of laugh to myself sometimes. I've kind of made this a saying. You see that in the, the first bullet point here. People are not stupid just because they disagree with us. Now, sometimes we might be tempted to think that, but it's actually not true. They have just as valid reasons for believing their opinion as we do. And so if we can allow people the freedom to have their own opinions and not believe that they're stupid just because they don't think, see things our way, we might learn something for one thing and definitely will have better relationships with others. The, the last bullet point here, or the second bullet point, kind of sums up the problem that we often have, and that is shooting the messenger. We don't like what someone says, and so again, we attack the person and not the problem. And so if we try to focus on fixing the problem instead of shooting the messenger, not only are we going to fix the problem better, but we're going to have better relationships with the people that we're dealing with. So what about when we're attacked? There will be times when people are going to say hurtful things to us in the genealogy community and elsewhere. Well, as my friend that I talked about mentioned, or as we learned from his experience of finding out that he was about to attack a relative, act, don't react. Wait before responding. If necessary, wait overnight. But don't just dash off an angry response because I have to say that pretty much every time, I would say either 99 or 100% of the time, when I have dashed off an angry response to someone, I have regretted it. I've regretted it. I've been embarrassed. It's hurt our relationship. It's just not worth it. And usually I've, I come to understand that I did not see the situation correctly. So act, don't react, and wait before responding. And when you uh, respond to the person, or before you respond to the person, pray for help. Pray for the ability to maybe understand where they're coming from and to respond in a Christ-like way. Don't take offense. It's been said that if we take offense when it wasn't intended, we're a fool. But if we take offense when it was intended, we're also a fool. Taking offense, and I think the reason for that is just because it hurts us. When we take offense with other people, I've heard it said that it's like swallowing poison, hoping that it will hurt the other person. But it really doesn't. And I actually just remembered one thing right now that C.S. Lewis said, that uh, sometimes when he had intended to in insult somebody, they never even knew it. And then when he hadn't intended to insult somebody, they got really offended. So that just shows that, you know, a lot of times we really don't know the thoughts and feelings of other people. So it's better not to take offense and to try and find out what's really going on, mend those bridges instead of burning them, and it, it just, everything ends up better that way. And the last point, of course, is to forgive. The other person may not be sorry. They may uh, be angry and they may not have any interest in reconciliation. Do you know what? It doesn't matter. Their feelings are their responsibility, and our feelings are our responsibility. And forgiveness is a gift that we give ourselves. So whether or not the person apologizes, whether or not they're sorry, if we can do our best to forgive them and pray for help as we need it, then at least we're going to have peace in our heart.
So we just went through the anniversary of 9-11. I imagine that many of us can remember where we were or what we were doing on that horrific day. Uh, I can still remember the devastating feeling of watching the planes carrying U.S. citizens crash into buildings and being responsible for killing other U.S. citizens. As I pondered that, it occurred to me that that type of attack is a repeating metaphor. It started in the Garden of Eden. Uh, James E. Talmadge in his book The Articles of Faith talks about how Eve was used to get to Adam to take to persuade him to partake of the forbidden fruit. So one person was basically used as a weapon against another. Cain was used as a weapon against Abel. And this story has repeated itself throughout the generations, throughout families. And this goes back to that earlier slide that one of Satan's traps is to get us to go against each other. Oh, please, let's try to avoid that trap. Let's not let him use us to hurt our beloved brothers and sisters. So let's look at a few scriptures that we can turn to that could help us avoid that trap. The Lord said in Doctrine and Covenants 38:27, I say unto you, be one, and if ye are not one, ye are not mine. Well, for all of us who want to be followers of Jesus Christ, we would want to be his. We would want him to be able to say, you are mine. And I know that the Lord doesn't mean by this that being one, that we have to be automatons or that we all have to think the same way or do the same things. We all have our own talents and skills and strengths. But when he says be one, I feel like he's saying be one in love for each other. Be one in accomplishing the goals of building Zion and of building the kingdom of God. This scripture was actually a little bit stunning to me when I thought about it. So you probably recognize that this scripture was given when the Savior was visiting the people on the American continent. He said to them, this is not my doctrine to stir up the hearts of men with anger one against another, but this is my doctrine that such things should be done away. When we think of the doctrine of Christ, we usually think of the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. Faith in Christ, repentance, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, laying on of hands and for the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. And yes, absolutely, that's the doctrine of Christ. But he is saying here that his doctrine also includes that we should do away with contention. So when we are helping to be peacemakers and to do away with anger and contention and fighting with each other, we're following the doctrine of Christ. And that was just powerful to me. I had never thought of avoiding contention as being part of the doctrine of Christ, but according to the words of the Savior, it is. We all want to build Zion. That's our, our great goal. And we've heard conference talks about that. We've read scriptures about it. Well, the Lord says in the Doctrine and Covenants that Zion cannot be built up unless it is by the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. And what is the great law of the celestial kingdom? It's the law of love. So if we want to build up Zion, then we'll be wanting to show love in our interactions with other people. And when we do that, of course, they're going to be civil. They're going to be kind and loving, and we're going to be building rapport instead of alienating people. We're going to be making progress on genealogy instead of putting up barriers. This last one, oh my gosh, I hope I can do this without getting emotional. I absolutely love this um, experience of the Lamanites that's recounted in Alma 24 where you probably remember that the uh, sons and of the convert Lamanites had gone to war, but their parents had resolved never to take up their swords again against any attacker. And so as a, a testament to everybody, and especially to the Lord, that they would never take up their weapons again, they buried them. They were willing to 
lose their lives rather than lift the sword against an enemy. I wonder, can we bury the sword of our uncivil words and refuse to take them up again, just like the Lamanites did? Can it be more important to us to be kind and loving and civil than to defend ourselves with anger? If we can follow the wonderful example of these Lamanites, I can't even imagine the good that that could do, not only in the genealogy community, but in our families, in our wards, in our communities, any place that we happen to be, in our school, in our workplace. If we bury the, the weapons of our incivility and instead choose to react with love, even when others don't treat us with love, there's no limit to the good that we can do. So here are a few Alma 5 style questions that we can ask maybe if we're tempted to dash off an angry reply to somebody. Am I using words to bless? Would I speak or write this way if the Savior were standing beside me? And I have to say that that has helped me on numerous occasions when I've been writing an email and I'm feeling a little bit tense. I stop to imagine, okay, Jesus knows what I'm writing, and if he were standing right here looking over my shoulder, watching what I'm writing, would I do this? And if the answer is no, then I revise the email or I don't send it. And finally, does my treatment of others invite the Holy Ghost rather than driving him away? We know that contention is of the devil and it does drive the Spirit of the Lord away. So if we're treating others in a way that keeps the Spirit with us, then we can be sure that we're treating them with love. And, we, if, we're, and if we're treating them with love, we won't be driving the Spirit away. I want to close by quoting one of my very favorite talks by Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. It's called The Tongue of Angels, and the citation is actually on the next page. If you haven't read it recently, I bet you would love to. I would encourage everybody, all of us, to read that and to take those words to heart. He says, May we speak with a new tongue, the tongue of angels. Our words, like our deeds, should be filled with faith and hope and charity. With such words, spoken under the influence of the Spirit, tears can be dried, hearts can be healed, lives can be elevated, hope can return, confidence can prevail. So it's my hope that we can improve the way that we're treating each other in the genealogy community and in every other aspect of our lives for that matter. And as we do, we'll be helping to build Zion, we'll be happier, we'll be helping other people to be happier, and we'll be moving the kingdom of God forward on the earth. So that brings us to the end of our webinar today. Thank you so much for coming. And Marin, do we have any uh, It looks like comments? we don't have any currently, but uh, we'll wait just a minute to see if anybody has any uh, comments or questions that they'd like uh, to Sounds good. Thank you. All right, it looks like uh, that's all the questions that we have for today. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, well, thank you all so much for uh, spending time with us today. Uh, we hope that this webinar has been a valuable use of your time and that you could learn something about uh, what you want to do in your own uh, genealogy community. 
Um, if you could take a moment to provide your thoughts on today's experience, we'd really appreciate it. You're more than welcome to suggest ideas for future webinars in the feedback and suggestion box at the bottom of the screen. Um, our next webinar will be on Thursday uh, with James Tanner. Um, and that will be at 4 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. He'll be giving a presentation entitled "Multiple uh, Using Multiple Online Genealogy Programs to Find Your Ancestors. Um, a, a recording of today's webinar will be posted to our website and our YouTube channel shortly. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to our Facebook and our Twitter to stay up to date with uh, the BYU Family History Library. Thank you so much again for joining us, and we hope that you have a wonderful weekend and hope to see you next Thursday.